right, guys. Um, I am very excited that we were able to bring in Mr. Rodriguez's class to join in with us. Um, I was talking with Ms. Breslow earlier, and she was sharing with me just the importance of continuing an education like this, to acknowledge that this event took place and to acknowledge everything that so many millions of people had to go through and how many millions of people and family were affected by this one very large event. And so I think that this is an absolutely tremendous, tremendous um, opportunity for you to not only meet but hear Ms. Breslow's story and get a first-hand account of such a big part of our history. Um, I really don't have too much to say because I just want Ms. Breslow to take it away. Um, if you could help me welcome her, please. Good morning. Good morning. I want to start with a sad story. Last Saturday in Pittsburgh, someone gunned down 11 Jews who were at worship. Why? I say the answer is hate, and my story will confirm it, what hate can do to people. Oh, somebody, <laughs> I should have had somebody, do you want to do that, change what, the picture? Right, I'm so untechnical. Sit down oh, to the right. <laughs> what? Sit down to the right. Uh, you're talking to a lot of people. I mean, I can talk, I yeah. know. I can okay, talk. that's the start. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. Now, this is a map of Germany, of course, and the, all of Europe, and Germany's in the brown. This is my favorite picture of my mother as she's contemplating her future way back in Germany in the 1930s, 1920s. Now, mom told me that before Hitler came to power, the Jews lived a normal life among their non-Jewish neighbors. She grew up in the northern part of Germany, the middle of three girls, in a rural area, and the city was called Milan. And this is simply her, as a teenager, having fun. To the right is mom's younger sister. The second one is mom. The third one is her oldest sister, Idle. Sadly, Idle, plus her husband, Otto, plus my cousin, Helga, and the vast majority of my family were all murdered by the Germans. So that leaves a void in my life which just can't be filled. And the last one is Selma, her best friend. You have to stay with me. Oh, now we travel to the south. Now, my dad comes from the south. He's the middle of three guys. And all three serve on the German side in World War I. This is obviously a World War I uniform. To the right is my dad, and to the left, his younger brother, Willie. There was an older brother, Sigbert. Notice the Iron Cross, a little bit like our Medal of Honor. And my dad got that for bravery fighting in France, but of course, he fought on the German side. My parents, again, before Hitler came to power, before they were married. Then comes 1933, and Adolf Hitler becomes the chancellor. He never hid his disdain for the Jewish minority. We were less than 1% of the German population. The majority of Germans adored him. There were huge rallies in his honor. By 1935, the German parliament passed the Nuremberg Laws. Their purpose was simply to separate us, German Jews, from the rest of the German population. I'm only going to touch a few that uh, affected my life. I was born in the southern part of Germany in a big city called Stuttgart, but lived much further south in a much smaller town called <coughs> Kirchheim under Tech. In Kirchheim, there was a very 
tiny Jewish population. This is our home. It takes up a whole block. The bottom is, we had sort of a dry goods store. And the middle, I think I, think I have a pointer in here, which would be helpful to me. And the um, uh, middle is our residence. And all the way up top is the, uh, we had rented out, up here, we had rented out to a couple. OK, this is another picturesque picture of Kirchheim. This is our home. And this, remember, we were back in the 1920s and 30s, is our main street. And I remember shopping with mom lots and lots of times. Now, this is one of the almost daily parades. Mom told me on almost a daily basis, there were big parades in Kirchheim, which is a small town, all in honor of Adolf Hitler. And the people were very enthused about their new leader, Adolf Hitler. Now, the first Nuremberg Law that affected me was the one that no non-Jew was allowed to continue working in a Jewish home. We had a live-in housekeeper. Her name was Sophie. She and I shared a bedroom. We ate most of our meals together. She was my best friend. And when she had to leave us, my first heartbreak, another law. No non-Jew was allowed to shop in a Jewish store. And I remember curled up in a windowsill in front of our large display window, I watched two members of the Nazi party in full uniform with rifles slung over their shoulders, marching back and forth in front of our front door. Needless to say, we lost all our customers. And of course, Dad was then out of business. This isn't, can we go back to the other for a second? This is another store in Kirchheim, not ours, but a Jewish store. And you see the guard here, here, and this is their front door. And I'm sure they lost their business just like we did. This is, Hedwig, uh, this is um, Sophie, uh, our housekeeper. Uh, and Hedwig used to take me for walks, just a kid, and that, that's me. Just for a little levity, <laughs> because it's not a happy subject I'm talking about. But I found this, and we have a holiday in Germany called Fasnacht, a little bit like our Halloween, which is coming up. Only the Germans liked parades. So on Fasnacht, there was a huge parade in Kirchheim. And a lot of the people in the parade had these aprons with large pockets. And they see somebody like me in costume. And what do they do? They throw candy at you. And I kind of like that holiday. <laughs> this is my kindergarten class. That's me. And this is my first day of school. Everybody got this cone. It's filled with candy. Now, the last Nuremberg Law I want to talk about is the one that was, for me, the most traumatic. And that one is, no Jewish child was allowed to continue attending public school. I was in first grade at that point, And I remember, after class, the teacher calls me to her desk and in a firm voice tells me, I can't come back to school because I'm a Jew, which for me was very bewildering and hard to understand. <laughs> I remember wandering out into the schoolyard, and the friends I'd come to school with that very morning, well, they'd left without me. And the only ones left in the schoolyard, a handful of young German boys who followed me home taunting me all the way. But I had a very best friend. Her name was Marianne. We'd been playing together almost since we could walk. She waited for me that day, walked home with me, tried to come for me, but I never saw her again. Finally gathered my courage and said to Mom, what happened to Marianne? Why did she also stop playing with me? Mom told me when her dad came home from work that evening and discovered she tried to remain my friend. 
he took off his belt and beat her, making her promise never to talk to me again, and she didn't. Needless to say, my life became very, very lonely. You're ahead of yourself. My life became very lonely after that. I had no friends to play with. I was totally boycotted. All my former friends, all the other kids in Kershaw, not one played with me ever again. And of course, I had no school. But so, so, so much worse was to happen to German Jews. The next big catastrophe was in November 9th, 10th, 1938, called in German, Kristallnacht. In English, the night of the broken glass. And that's the night we Jews lost all of our civil rights and our civil liberties. 400 synagogues were burned to the ground. Old Jewish men in their 80s and 90s were actually dragged from their beds, dumped into lorries, taken to concentration camps. The Jewish stores were broken into. People just took a rock threw it into the window of his store and helped himself to merchandise. Here's just an example of one of the synagogues burning and, and one of these stores that had just a broken windows. And Oh, the police were there. But what were they there for? To keep the Jewish owner from going into his own store trying to save some of his own merchandise. I would say it's pretty safe for me to say there wasn't a German Jew after Kristallnacht who didn't want to get out of Germany. Our big problem was where to go. What country would help us? That was the problem <coughs> of German Jews. My own dad, <coughs> who can trace his ancestry way back to the 15th century in Germany, had in his possession his grandmother's Bible. On the back pages were names, addresses of family members that had emigrated from Germany throughout the years. He wrote to all of them, pleading with them to help us get out of Germany. And he finally got one, just one response from a very distant cousin, lived right here in America, Henry Katz lived in Philly, in Germantown, and he wrote my dad he would help us come to the U.S. Of course, these things take time. One of the days that my parents were once again discussing their dilemma and deciding or trying to decide where to go, dad gets an unexpected phone call from a former classmate. He now owned a travel agency, and he told my father, there was room on a ship which was going to Cuba for one person. And he wanted to give Dad the opportunity to get out of Germany. Now, as much as Dad wanted to go, he wasn't that keen about leaving Mom and I behind. It was my mother, in her wisdom, who insisted this unexpected opportunity, go, leave which he did, but before he left Germany, he had to sell our house. Now, years later, he told me, of course, there was somebody in Kirchheim perfectly willing to buy our house, but the sale never went through because the head of the Gestapo in Kirchheim also wanted our home. One day, he called into Gestapo headquarters. They gave him some papers to sign. He read them through, and he realized he's almost giving his house away, so he protested. And they laughed at him, and they said, don't sign the papers. But the papers you need signed to get out of Germany, we're not going to sign. So of course, he signed, and he left. Now mom and I were homeless. So we moved back to Stuttgart, and we live in, here you'd call it a boarding home. Now my mother had already purchased two more tickets on another ship going to Cuba. Our ship was going to leave Germany June the 1st, 
1939. One day, Mom gets a phone call from her travel agent, and he tells her, there's so many German Jews leaving Germany for Cuba. We set up this huge, luxurious liner which is going to hold a thousand people. But most importantly, it was going to leave May 13, 1939. And he wanted to know if she wanted to change her reservations. And mom immediately said, yes. Just as a point of information, the ship we were supposed to take, June the 1st, never left Germany. So May the 13th. 1939, Mom and I boarded the ship. Are you a problem? No. No, oh, we'll skip the. How much do you want to skip? Huh? Oh, turn around, how much do you want to skip? Oh, no, just, that's it, perfect, perfect. Mom and I boarded a ship called the St. Louis. There were roughly around uh, 940 German Jews on it. Uh, about 400 of them were women and somewhere around 200 kids. Every passenger had to purchase extra a legal landing certificate. This was signed by Cuba's Minister of Immigration. That was our guarantee to be able to enter Cuba. And meantime, in back, meantime, in Germany, the situation for German Jews was getting worse on a daily basis. One day a degree had been passed and suddenly every German female had gotten a, a middle name, Sarah, and every male had one, Israel. That's what this is about. This is mom's passport. The J stands for Yud no Jew. And Ellie is mom's first name, Sarah, courtesy of the German government, Rutlinger's a last name. And I'm with mom, and this is dad. His first name is Gustav. Israel, again, courtesy of the German government, Rudlinger. The voyage itself from Hamburg, where we started, you can see it here, going all the way to Atlantic until we finally reach Cuba. And here's the time factor uh, of the voyage itself. This is just one of the decks, Mom and I, on the ship, the uh, St. Louis. Now, for me, it was sort of a little bit of an adventure. Mom had told me we're going to Cuba to be with my dad. I was always at daddy's school, so I was very happy to be able to go where he was waiting for us. The ship itself had eight decks. It had a large toy room with all kinds of toys and games and books to read. There were two swimming pools, one for non-swimmers. Well, that was, that was me. <coughs> so there was nothing not to enjoy. Now, to about three days prior to arriving in Cuba, the captain gave a ball for the passengers. And I remember sitting in, <coughs> in our room arguing with my mother, which was nothing new for me to argue with her that I wanted to go to the ball. I saw her getting dressed to go out. And to me, I didn't know what a ball was, but I thought it was some kind of a party. And I saw no reason why she should go and I should have to stay and go to bed, which is what she's telling me to do. Anyway, she insists I put on my pajamas and go to bed, so I did that. But when she left to go to the ball, I got dressed again. And I followed her, a long, wide corridor on the ship, I already heard the music. They were having Strauss waltzes, and it was a big orchestra. And uh, I peered, there was a big, big, big staircase. I just peered down, I saw the ballroom. And what I saw was adults, like here, this is mom, dancing, having what looked to me like a good time. But after a while, I got bored, and I just was happy to go, to go back to bed. Why were they so happy at this point? Well, they were two days away from freedom. They'd be in Cuba. They'd be free. They'd be able to lead their lives again. 
That's what came to my mind. But our day of arrival in Cuba, I will always remember. I remember being very excited. The ship arrived very early in the morning, somewhere around 5 a.m. Mom and I had an early breakfast in the ship's dining room when the loudspeaker beckoned us on deck. And as I looked overboard, I saw my dad. He was standing up in this tiny little rowboat, which was just bopping back and forth with the waves. And he was waving up at us and smiling. I'm sure I smiled. I was so happy to see him. Years later, when I asked him about it, he told me he'd been so eager to be together with us, his little immediate family, that he stood vigil on the shore in Havana throughout the night. And the moment the ship docked, he paid a Cuban to row him as close to us as he was legally permitted. Then every day I would say to my mother, when are we getting off the ship? Her answer was always the same. Tomorrow is what she said. Now to give you kids a background so you know what am I talking about. What had happened was that even though we had paid for the legal landing certificates, the Cuban government would not allow us off the ship. We could not enter Cuba. Now prior to our ship landing, which included my dad, there were many other ships all German Jews, all going to Cuba. No problem. We were the one ship that was stopped. And what is rarely mentioned, but it's important to me, that there were two, I believe three, but a positive of two ships following the St. Louis. On the other ships were German Jews. They had purchased the same legal landing certificates we had. Now, when the captain of the other ship saw that we couldn't get into Cuba, what did they do? They turned their ships around and went back to Germany. It took me over a year to learn what happened to these Jews. And I finally learned that once they reached Germany, the German government told them they're not citizens anymore and wouldn't let them into the country. So they were immediately taken to concentration camps. This would have been our fate if Gustav Schroeder, our captain, my hero, you know every good story has a hero. Mine is the captain of the ship. Gustav Schroeder was a German captain, the shortest captain in the German Navy, but to us, the passengers, he was 6'10". He was definitely our hero. He was getting cablegrams from the German government to bring the ship back. Meantime, the whole story became worldwide news. You notice all these little, this is before the computer and internet, etc. These little, they had the <coughs> newspaper reporters on them. And this, of course, is the St. Louis. Again, our story became worldwide news. Now, our captain was sending cablegrams to your government. The president at that time was the Democratic Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He just ignored all the pleas from Gustav Schroeder about letting us into America. In addition, you should know that from Germany to America, there was a quota somewhere around 27,500 roughly, all of the passengers had very low quota numbers because in 1939, the German people were quite content under the Nazi rule. In our case, we could have legally come to the US too, two short months later. And Ellis Island was still open in 1939 had the president allowed us entry, which he did not. OK, so that gives you enough of a background. Let's go back to the ship. One day, and this is sad, in Cuba, getting a briefing on what is happening 
on the ship. You can imagine how he felt. I mean, they had absolutely um, nothing that they could do to help us. I forgot what the next picture was. Oh, this is uh, years later, uh, mom's friend who lived in Switzerland said, she said this was front page of the, like we have a Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, and this is mom and I. So the news was definitely world, worldwide. This is my hero, our captain, Gustav. By the way, this captain had a young wife and two little girls in Germany, and he was now getting threatening cablegrams from the German government to bring us back. According to my mother, he had a meeting with the adults, and he promised them that under <coughs> no circumstances, none, would he ever take the ship back to Germany. So going back to 1939 and the ship, one day I'm playing on deck, and I feel the lurching of the ship, and I realize we're moving. So I panic, and I rush into mom's cabin only to see her lying on her cot, sobbing uncontrollably. So I wander up on deck, and there were the adults, men and women, and the tears are streaming down their faces. I don't know what's going on. I'm eight years old, but I certainly know I'm going somewhere. My dad's in Cuba but I hadn't a clue as to where I was going. I would have been even more scared if I realized the adults had no idea where we were headed. And our captain was desperately trying to find a place to put us. We passed the Miami coastline so close that every passenger aboard the ship could easily see the shimmering lights of Miami Beach. That's how close to Miami we came. One final cablegram, it's all documented, was sent by our captain, Gustav Schroeder, to your president, pleading with him to allow the 200 kids aboard the St. Louis sanctuary, to which he did not respond. I personally think he did respond. And this is how I think he responded. Coming directly from Miami Beach was a US Coast Guard cutter with guns. I remember waving to the captain. I was sure he was here to help us. But the truth was, his orders directly from the president were, get the ship out of American waters pronto, which he did. So then the St. Louis began to circle the Atlantic Ocean. Of course, by that time, supplies were getting dimmer. Luckily for us, there was a Mr. Trooper who was the head of an organization called the Joint Distribution Committee. And it helped people in distress. And he was able, he was situated in France, he wasn't from the US, able to find four countries to take us in. And those four countries were England, Holland, Belgium, and France. And of course, the whole tragedy of the St. Louis was that when Holland, Belgium, and France was overrun by Germans, not all, but too many of the passengers were recaptured. Now the entire ship went to Antwerp, Belgium. In Antwerp, <coughs> I saw another ship coming toward us, a much smaller one, and roughly around 250 of the passengers went on that ship and their destination was England. And I'm <coughs> happy to say every one of them was saved. Mom and I went to Holland. There were 181 of the passengers that went to Holland. And I remember boarding a much smaller boat. And as we were going, gliding along the Dutch coastline, which was very hilly, it looked to me like there were hundreds of 
Dutch people on the hills. Some of the women with those fancy hats, some of the men wore wooden shoes. At any rate, when we passed, they all clapped and cheered us on, which made me feel a little bit better at that point. We went to Rotterdam, and in Rotterdam, we were placed in a detention camp, which was called Rotterdam West. Their mom was put in what they called an adult compound, and I in a children's compound, so we were separated. Now, I'd be the first one to tell you, of course, there's a huge difference between a concentration camp and a detention camp, but our detention camp had a high barbed wire fence. It had a closed gate. There was, of course, a guard at the gate with a gun and the dogs. You could only leave if you got permission from the commander, he was called. That was the guy who was in charge of the entire compound. All I remember basically about the camp is one, I was always hungry. I don't want to imply we were not fed, just not enough. Secondly, it was filthy. Most of us, when we think of camp, we think of grass. There was not a blade of grass in the camp. Nothing but dirt and lots and lots and lots of little stones. And being Holland, of course, there was a lot of rain, so there's a lot of mud. And finally, I'm switching out to October. We're still stuck in this camp. It got cold. I had one suitcase. Mom packed it in May in Germany in May, never anticipating that we would be in Holland in October. Where it got cold. The winds were coming in. It was right off the Atlantic Ocean. I could have walked into the Atlantic Ocean. There was no barrier there. So coming in from the Atlantic Ocean was a really, the winds were terrific. I got a severe eye infection, just the rim of the eye, which turned very red because, of course, there was no doctors there to treat it or, <coughs> or anything like that. What was another picture of where I am at this point? Oh, this is when Mom, when we were arrived. As I said, the ship went to Antwerp, and it, it was to Dad, who was still in Cuba. And it just said that we saved that we landed safely in Antwerp. Uh, this is just a few of mom's friends. She borrowed me for that picture. Obviously, it wasn't 180, but you notice this bunch of young guys here. And these were her friends from the ship. And I got a card. My um, favorite uncle, Willie, who was dad's younger brother, Later, he and the older brother walked illegally all the way to Shanghai. That is a different story. But he was still in Germany. Notice Hitler and the stamp here. And he sent this to me in camp to see how I was doing. Now, before I, I get to, um, to this, I want to say that the um, two good things happened in the camp that I recall. One. One day, this big truck comes in from the Joint Distribution Committee. It parks in the middle of the children's compound. The back opens up and out spills, oh, lots and lots and lots of children's clothes. I remember watching other kids just get clothes, but it finally dawns on me, I don't have anybody here to help me. If I don't do for myself, it just won't get done. So I see this little blue coat I had my eye on, and I grabbed it. It's a bit small, but it uh, was warm. I lived in that coat I wore during the day to keep me warm, and I slept in it to keep me warm. The other, only other nice event I recall is one day mom came to the children's compound with a raw egg. We went to the bathroom, she put on the hot water, which of course remained lukewarm. The raw egg remained a raw egg. Let me tell you kids, that was the best egg I ever ate. Why? I was hungry. It was that basic. So now, Skipping dad gets legally comes to America from Cuba. Sends mom this cablegram which just says that he just arrived in Cuba, in Miami, and he's rushing to Washington because this I want you to understand. Every person in the detention camp I was in could have legally come to America. The two months were way over. Only they needed help somebody in the U.S. or some agency to bring them over. We 
Mom and I had to help my dad, of course. Unfortunately, he couldn't help anybody else. And he continues to write that he's going to Philly and he's going to get us an apartment, which is pretty optimistic considering that we're still stuck in the detention camp. At any rate, mom gets permission to leave the camp and visit the American consulate. He said to her in Rotterdam, there's no more ships leaving Holland. He recommended to my mother, this is amazing, Stay in the detention camp until the war's over. Now, when we were in Holland, the war had not begun. The adults knew that eventually the Germans would be going into Holland. So they're expecting a war. And he's telling her the war that hadn't started. She should stay in the camp until that war is over. Well, I think anybody will recognize that is not good advice coming from the American consulate. She had very, very few uh, avenues to be able to, uh, get, to get to the US. So her next step was to go to the commander, the person in charge of the compound. Now, since I have time, I'll tell you a story I shared. Sometimes I don't know that kids always like. It's about the steps. Back in Germany, my mother, we're not going back for 30 seconds, to Germany, my mom's packing my suitcase, and she tells me I can have one item, one item to take with me. That's it. I had lots of stuff. I had books and toys and so forth. And I had to pick one. Think of your own rooms. You could probably take your, your phones. <laughs> I didn't have any of that. But the bottom line is I had to make a decision. I knew that everything else in that room would remain. One item, and I finally chose a stamp collection, which was in an album. Why? I wasn't a stamp collector, because my favorite Uncle Willie, when he saw that I was at home all the time with nothing to do, wanted to help me a little bit. So he started with me, a stamp collection. First of all, to teach me a little geography. He explained the, <coughs> what the pictures meant and a little bit of history, we put it together in a stamp book. I was not sure that I would ever see him again, and that's why I chose the stamp collection, simply as sort of a memory of my uncle. Now we're back in the detention camp. Mom discovers that the commander is a stamp collector. Now in this camp, do you think she could have bought some flowers for him, or candy. Nothing like that was in our detention camps. So she decided my stamp collection would be a proper gift. So she comes to the children's compound, and she says to me, I want your stamp collection. And I say to her, no way. This is mine. It's not yours. And I simply would not give her my stamp collection. So she leaves, and I thought that was the end of it. One day, from playing outside, I come back. Now, I slept in a dormitory which had no, and I mean no furniture except a cot. There was a cot. I actually, uh, from the ground outside, uh, took one of those, uh, uh, I saw a box, and then I just brought that in. I put some of the stuff on top of it, but there was no furniture. You took your suitcase and you put it under the cot. Then when you needed something, you took it out. So in, <coughs> in that space that I made for myself, I had my stamp collection. So I come back and I see it's missing. And I know right away that nobody took it except for my mother. And that's what happened. Mom, when I wasn't around, went into my dorm where all the girls were sleeping in one area and took the stamp collection. She gave it to the commander. To this very day, I think he would have helped us without my stamp collection. But it was gone, and there was no, nothing, nothing I could do about it. So she goes to the commander and explains her problem. And he says to her, luckily for us, he was a captain in the Dutch Navy. So he tells her, it's true. There really are no more ships going from Holland to US. What? 
Antwerp, Belgium. They still have ships going to America. Why don't you go to Antwerp? And of course, mom immediately said, yes. I kind of think the American counselor also had this info, just didn't want to pass it on to us. So that's what happened. Mom and I went to Antwerp, Belgium. And there, we had a wonderful surprise. Mom's younger sister, Lisa, you saw her in the motorcycle, with her husband, Walter. Walter, on Kristallnacht, was sent to the Buchenwald concentration camp, which is another story. And it was really like being in hell from the way he described it to us. But both of them got to Antwerp. One sister knew nothing about the other. It was a total coincidence that both of them were in Antwerp at the same time, taking the same ship to America. For me, there was a little extra dividend in there. And that's because my aunt and uncle went first class. We were third class. And each morning, I just went up a steep steps all the way to first class. And I had my meals with my aunt and uncle. And nobody ever said anything to me that I was eating in the wrong place. So they just left me alone. Mom couldn't do it. Meantime, Mom's trying to cheer me up. I'm pretty surly at this point. She's telling me, we're going to America. You're going to be with your dad. We're going to arrive in a couple of days. It'll be great. I was in the unfortunate position of not believing a word Mom said. I knew there were situations beyond the control of your parents, beyond their control. And I thought, Mom doesn't know what's going on. And I didn't believe it, but I was smart enough not to verbalize, but simply to think these thoughts. It wasn't until we actually reached New York Harbor. I'm going down the gangplank. I see my dad. He's coming toward me from the shore. He's running toward me. He picks me up, grabs me, twirls me around. Then I knew she had been telling me the truth, and I was happy. But as I looked around, in Europe, everybody moves at a leisurely pace. Here. New York Harbor, it looked to me like everybody's running somewhere. And I didn't understand it. So I said to Dad, what is wrong? Where's everybody going? And my dad laughs. And he said, this is America. And I want to add that I realize I am very lucky, very lucky to be in this wonderful country we call the United States of America, where we have our freedom. But I want to caution all of you to remain vigilant because this very precious gift called freedom is not free. We all know that. God bless our country, America. I'm sorry. <laughs> I get carried away and forget it very quickly. This is just, sure. Here, this, is just a, uh, this is a state of home green cards when we arrived in New York and read them, which was uh, November the 10th. Oh, I wrote a book, forgot about that too, okay. <laughs> but uh, after that, it, okay, that was a random, we'll skip, okay. Rather have questions. Uh, that's the ship I came to the, uh, that's a totally different, uh, came to the US. Um, they have these, very briefly, these stones now in Germany in front of uh, Jewish property. Uh, and somebody in Kirchheim had sent them to me, uh, aunts and uncles. As I said, most of the family perished in Germany. They're now in front of the, they would, it says very clearly here, Wolf, that's him, was deported in 41. And he ended out in Reba concentration camp, etc. And she's up there, Babette. Uh, the thing is that they have these plaques in front of the houses of the. I don't know what the point is of that personally. This again, my personal opinion. But she sent it to me from uh, from Germany to show that my family, you know, that plot plaques in their memory, which doesn't do them any good. They they're dead. But okay. All right. I hope you kids have some questions for me. <laughs> Okay, so um, if we have any questions, I know my class, you were thinking about questions earlier in the day of things that you could ask. Um, so just 
to kind of open the floor if anybody has any questions. Um, like I'm sure that like losing your whole family still hits you, of course, but like. Are you at a point in telling your story where like you're perfectly comfortable with saying it and it's like more of like a powerful message than like a sorrowful one? The second, yeah. I'm perfectly comfortable. I've been talking uh, for years and years. And uh, I just think uh, history, uh, if we don't learn from it, we're just doomed to repeat it. And I see in my own lifetime history repeating itself. Anti-Semitism is becoming worse, particularly in Europe, but it's starting to hit, you know, the synagogue that was where the innocent people were just shot because they're saying prayers on Shabbos, I mean, on the Saturday. So I figured kids, your age and so forth, will learn that hate just grows and gets where it doesn't stay. It started with the Jews in Germany. It sure didn't stop there. It goes on and it grows. Hate just grows. And I don't know why evil. I, th I think people are probably born evil or good. I mean, this is just a personal uh, thought of mine. I don't know, but it's, I think it's important for you kids to understand what hate can do. And I mean, it's really evil, evil, hate, whatever you want. It's the same thing. The bottom line is to stop it from happening. One of the big problems with the Germans were we call them bystanders now here. They just didn't do anything. There is no way, no way in hell that the Germans didn't know what was happening to the Jews. That's impossible. It is impossible. People are taken out of their homes and uh, there's just no way of, of uh, them not knowing. So many of them, what did they do? Nothing. They did nothing and that was the mistake. That's why I give the example of what happened to my best friend for her father. Instead of saying, if he was a good person, good for you. You know, the German government, the Nazis, did not come near my house to say, don't you dare play with this child. I didn't get a sign that said, nobody can play with you. You know, you, you have to stay alone. No, these were the people in Kirchheim's own decision the father decided, his daughter made a big mistake by playing with me. That was hate already from the father up. So this was the kids and the people in Kirchheim that made these decisions. It didn't come from higher up. There's no way this entire situation with the help of the actual average person just not sitting by and doing something. And I'm hoping that if we ever have problems here, you kids will step up and make sure that it's nipped in the bud because it just grows and gets worse and worse. It's all part of the education. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Good. <laughs> Another question? Oh, yeah. Uh, when your father left, were you, did you ever like hold a grudge against him? Like when you guys like met with each other again, were you just, did you just forgive him? Or? Oh, I missed him. I was always the daddy's baby. I had many arguments with mom throughout my life, and she was a wonderful person, but I was just the daddy's baby. I just missed him. I didn't think, I, I didn't know what was going on. And I was never, it was never explained to me. So as I said, or this is why I said on the ship, when I asked mom what's happening, there was never an explanation why we're having trouble leaving the ship. We're having trouble going into Cuba to be with your dad. The answer I got when I said, when are, when are we leaving? When are we going? She says, tomorrow. That's not an answer, but that's the answer I got. So I didn't understand anything. I just thought, well, we're here for, you know, when you're eight years old, you don't think, well, now, let me see, we're here a week, there's something wrong. Well, I should figure out what's wrong. You don't think that way. You play, go back to playing and you assume that you get off, you know, and that's all. You don't, uh, you don't, you know, the, your thought process doesn't work that way. At least mine didn't. So, no, I never thought there was, I'm, I was grateful. You know, if my dad hadn't listened to mom, if he hadn't left, I wouldn't be here sharing my story. The people that were with us in Holland, in the detention camp were family units.
father, mother, and kid. That would have been us if we'd all gone together on the ship. So he would have been stuck with us. The fact that he was able to come to America and bring us over is what saved our lives. I mean, a lot of things saved him, but that was one of them. So I have nothing else. I was grateful to him for, uh, you know, for being there for us. That's how I saw it. So when, I mean, I'm have sorry. You been, have you been like listening or watching the news and stuff like that from when you were younger up until now? Uh, well, I went through a, a whole uh, a period uh, where I certainly did not watch the news. I was nine years old when I came uh, to America. I didn't know the language or anything. It was a very, very, very big adjustment for me. Oh, so, so you're saying you, you haven't, like, Well, meantime, I'm a no lady. <laughs> so, of course, I'm watching the news. I'm exceedingly interested in what's going on. And, Increase in anti-Semitism. I'm very disturbed what happened in Pittsburgh. It's very close to us, Philly, Pittsburgh. We're all in Pennsylvania together. But, uh, you know, it's just amazing how hate, how easy, easy it is for certain people to just hate, to hate enough to kill people you don't even know. It's and so meaningless. It's, it's worse than just the Jews. That, yes. I'm, just, I'm not saying it's not like it wasn't bad, but that's bad too. It's worse than what you think. Like, just, just not. It's not just that. Just happening. You're absolutely it's, it's not, correct. It's, it's just a lot more. You're absolutely correct. And I think you you need to be notified too. If you, if yeah. you want to know things like that, I know you, you don't want to like. <laughs> I think I just think you should be. I think you should know. Of course. You're right, it's the world. But I thought that by sharing my story, it would just emphasize the importance of getting involved and being so. You know, I, I can only share my story, what happened to me, and what can happen when these dreadful things go on. And, and you're right, I mean, the way the gypsies, uh, that's a totally different story, were treated in Germany was beyond belief, so, and so on. So, uh, anybody else have a question? Yeah. Um, what did your necklace mean to you? I'm sorry. Your necklace. <laughs> My necklace. Well, interestingly enough, this is um, from um, Israeli bonds. If you buy Israeli bonds uh, and you buy a certain amount, it's like a little reward kind of uh, kind of thing. But uh, if the message, if this is, if this necklace is the message, it's about. Uh, the state of Israel. You know, during the Holocaust, there was no state of Israel. It was called Palestine at the time. And many Jews wanted to go to what was called Palestine, including my parents. But at that time, the English government had what they called the white paper and kept Jews from co coming into Palestine. If there had been a state of Israel, every Jew could have been I can't say every, because one never knows. The, but most Jews could have been saved. The problem was the world was complicit. The St. Louis, everybody knew what was happening on the ship, even without your cell phones and all that other stuff you have today. And what did they do? Nothing. That's why it took a lot of extra work on this from Mr. Trooper to get find us he didn't realize at the time that when people went to Holland, Belgium, and France, he didn't think, oh, well, that's going to be invaded by the Germans. This is no place to put them. You know, he just thought, well, thank goodness it's a country to take them, and that all came in the future. Did you ever, um, did you ever feel resentful of, like, like um, anybody not doing nothing? Can you speak a little bit louder? I'm sorry. Did you ever feel resentful of, of like, no other states? Resentful? Because people who didn't help. Like, did you ever have oh. any, did that ever develop into a, uh, a resentment or a bitterness towards, you know? Well, all this resentment, bitterness is just a waste of energy, mm -hmm. the way I see it. I mean, you can try to improve and, and do something about it. it. It doesn't help anybody or anything if you just become resentful or full of hate. Or, it, doesn't or all. it doesn't change anything. That's exactly right. So uh, it's, it's, to me, just wasted energy. Mm -hmm. No. But uh, they should have, they should, more should have been done. And uh, that's why I go telling the story, so that if 
we have problems in the USA. And you know, this freedom is really important today. It is easy to get a regime that is not for freedom. It's very easy, like Venezuela, et cetera, et cetera, these states that were free. That is the most important thing we have going for us in this country, freedom, that we can select our legislators. Be nice if we did it more civilly. <laughs> but the point is, that's what freedom is about. And until you lose it, you don't know how important it is. German Jews had totally lost their freedom. Look how it started with the Nuremberg laws. First, no non-Jew could work in a Jewish home. If enough non-Jews working in Jewish homes had said, I'm not going to stop working here. I like my job. I like the family I work for. Why should I stop working? No. What Sophie did was just leave because the government told her to do so. Are you following me, how this, how this work process works? Okay. Um, does it upset you at all that there are still people who speculate that the Holocaust didn't happen? Well, <laughs> I, I mean, it's so absurd. There is so, so, so much material. It's one thing the Germans, that material on the Holocaust, that when you hear things like the Holocaust never happened, it's such bull. I mean, the people who say that, they know the Holocaust happened. They're trying to influence people that aren't aware of it. Again, which is the reason I go to school. Nobody, if somebody said to you, you know what, the truth is it's still a bunch of lies. Jews are making up the story. The Holocaust really never happened. It's just a bunch of, you can say, well, that's not true. I happen to know somebody that was in ba ba ba, and so on we go. So this is the whole point. And, then, and it's all over in the internet, it's there, there's no, that's what I'm saying, the people themselves, they're just haters. They're just haters, it's, uh, and to me it's totally. ridiculous with keeping details, they had lists of everything. Everything, everything. everything. they took from people was documented. It everything. was totally documented, yeah. Um, did you ever question your religion, like if you wanted to stay Jewish or not? That's a very good question because they were. People, absolutely, German Jews had just um, either changed their religion or became totally secular. That is certainly true. But there were also many German Jews who became more religious. My husband, who happened also um, to be a German Jew, became more religious. So it goes both ways. Look, we have an American Jews that are not really affiliated with their faith in the sense that they go to synagogue, et cetera, et cetera, that they marry someone, you know, a Jewish person and so forth. So it's not only, you know, German Jews, but there are definitely Jews, yes, that decided they would, it would be safer for their kids. There was a story just, re just last week, I think, I got in one of my emails about this particular family Nobody knew that the grandmother actually had fled Germany and that she was part of the Holocaust. She said she was Christian, she married a Christian, etc. Her granddaughter came to her one day with a very anti-Semitic remark about the Jews. And that's when she woke up and she said, I think I should tell you that, and she did. And there was a big shock to the whole family, including her husband, because she kept it to herself. And that's when she began with the story. So everybody acts on an individual level, you know. So it's... But, Mrs. Grizzle, I yeah. just want to mention of course. that in Germany, in Hitler's time, it didn't matter that you converted out. It didn't that's save you. you. Yeah, so that's you true, but that's... the holiest Catholic or yeah, that's whatever, true. whatever, if you have German blood in you, you were still rounded up. Absolutely, but I don't think... If I understood your correction, I think you... Your, your question, I think you wanted to know whether because of what happened, yeah. that that's what I thought her question. But you're absolutely 100% right. It could be one quarter and then it got worse and worse, yeah. You had a couple of hands back here. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm ladies. sorry. Just, yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't see you back there. All right, I have one question. Um, Can you just speak up? Um, did you get any news of what happened to the, 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 the 
um, the camp that she was in, like the Germany hit the camp or and any news about the um, the, t the detention camp? camp. The detention yes. camp. You know oh, of course I know about the detention camp. I'll tell you something. If you read about the St. Louis now and the people that went to Holland, forget about Rotterdam West. It's not in the books anymore. It's forgotten. Everybody from Rotterdam West, and this happened about two weeks after we left, went to the Westerberg concentration camp. Now, if you know the Anne Frank story, which oh. is quite popular, you know that she went to Westerberg. The first ones that went to Westerberg were people from the St. Louis. And the guys you saw in the picture, the Westerberg was built up by Dutch government and by Dutch Jews. And some of the volunteers from Rotterdam West that were still in, in, in that camp went to the Westerberg camp. It was supposed to be a nicer place for the Jews to reside in, because when I tell you that Rotterdam West was a dump, it was a dump. They, even the government didn't like it and, and just abolished it. It was right by the sea. It was really terrible. So they all went to Westerberg. But the latest thing I've read, and I found this interesting, is that <laughs> Rotterdam West is off the, it's wiped off the map. So very few people, once I kick the bucket, <laughs> I don't think anybody will ever know about it. They'll all say, because this is what they said in the written material I read, people from the St. Louis Holland were then sent to Westerberg. And it's not true. I know that I was there. But afterwards, they did. That's where it came from. They did go to Westerberg. And years later, I went to Westerberg to see it. And it was a huge place. It was not a death camp. What happened is, there's a certain amount of people allowed in, maybe four or five hundred, and when they uh, exceeded that number, when there were more people, it's nice to have me in the class, when they had more people, they went on trains, and the trains went directly to Auschwitz. I saw the trains, the tracks, etc., and uh, that's how they got rid of, instead of killing the people, that's how they got rid of the excess. So those that had been longest in the camp were simply taken by trains to a death camp. That's, that's what happened in Westerberg. Have you been back to Germany? Uh, yeah, I did go one time. I never wanted to go. But uh, I, did, I did go back one time because, as I said, Thank you. you're welcome. I'm so sorry. Right now, there's a couple students. Oh, well, of course. I understand. I've been at school. I, I understand. I, I realize. It was nice to have you in the class, yeah. You got to go, you got to go. Sure. Anyway, my husband also, he came from Düsseldorf, a large city, totally different story. But he got an invitation, I got an, mom and I got an invitation to go back to Kirchheim where we came from. My mother got the invitation. And I thought to myself, at that time, I'm going to do exactly what my mother wants. If my mother wants to go back to Kirchheim, I will go with her. If she decides she doesn't want to go, I won't go either. So she read the letter. She doesn't say a word to me. She takes it, dumps it in the trash. I kind of knew she didn't want to go. But years later, my husband, and he knew I didn't want to go back to Germany, got a big letter from Düsseldorf inviting him to come. And he said to me, I'm going. You can go. You can stay. I'm going. So I had the option of staying here while he goes off to Germany. And I'm thinking, I can do some other things. So I said, I will go with you if you take me to Holland to Westerberg. I wanted to see that. He wanted to go to Switzerland. That's where he was born. He was a Swiss. And if you think, when I try to tell you, since I'm talking about him, about how other governments acted. Now, my mother-in-law was Swiss, born in Switzerland, Switzerland citizenship. She went to Germany after college to work, never gave up her citizenship, married a German Jew, lived in Germany, and my husband and his sister were uh, the result. When 
Crystal not having. She wanted to go back to Switzerland. They couldn't keep her out. She was Swiss. They would not allow her husband to enter Switzerland. They couldn't keep the kids out, so she and her two kids moved back to Switzerland. From Switzerland, they had no problem coming to America. Not too many people in Switzerland wanted to leave. So they had no problem getting in. She got him out, and I was telling that to the gentleman he left, that my father-in-law uh, father got to America December the 5th, 1941. They were still able to get out. The question was, the big question was, what country would take us in? That was the big question. That's how it started, and it mushroomed into concentration camp. It didn't start with concentration camp. It mushroomed, it got worse and worse and worse. And that's the problem with these situations. That's why you kids have to make sure that it never happens in the USA. You have to be active. You have to speak up. It's, you're our youth. You're our future. And we depend on you to do, to do that. That's why I share my story. Did that answer your question? Yes, you did. Okay, Thank good. You. Maybe one more question? Anybody else have one more? You have three kids? Sorry. Yes, yes, I have three kids, yes, yes, yes. And they know about the Holocaust. As I said, I was speaking uh, for many years, and when my son was about 10, 11, I made him go with me. Uh, I went to some, he was not interested in going with me to schools. And I said, okay, you don't have to stay in the room. You can take a book, but you're going with me. So there were times that he was in the room, I don't know whether he got bored or what, but he left the room, and I found him sitting outside reading a book. I didn't, I didn't scold him or anything. I, I did as much as I could. I was right, he, he was right there. He could have listened if he wanted to. Also, the Holocaust in our house was brought up constantly. <laughs> what do you mean? I don't want, send, <laughs> can't you say that? So send, uh, send this food to, to, the, to a camp for somebody else. I don't want to. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's the old story of uh, if I had been, uh, you know, way back when, I would have been thrilled to have a nice dinner like this or something like that. And they're picky eaters, they don't want to eat, they just, so send it to, to people that need the food. You know, I mean, my kids <laughs> fully aware of the whole. No, they are families where it's not discussed. So again, it's a, really an individual thing. You know, we all react in our own way differently. Frankly, my own dad was surprised when I started to talk, and he said, why do you do that? Why, why do you bother speaking about it? He didn't want to talk. I don't know much about what happened to him in Cuba. I had to ask different questions, because he was in Cuba for almost a year, and he didn't want to talk about it. So everybody you know, reacts differently. I just think it's important to share. And, uh, and you kids can look all this up on the internet. you have a question, or you just? Yeah, I'm sorry, one more. Okay. Uh, listen, so more. after after everything, like after going through everything, you guys finally settled down. Like, where did you guys finally settle down at? And like, we came how to, was it? Uh, when we came to America, we came directly to Philly. Why? Because I said, uh, yeah, the Uncle Henry, yeah, yeah, they lived in Philly. They oh, lived so you guys in, end up making in Germantown. Right yeah. now, we didn't stay with them. You know, we had the, an apartment. But that's it. but my I, my worst time in my life was when I first came to the United States. I didn't know a word of English. I was skinny as a rod. I had this eye infection, which still we didn't have the money to go to a doctor. Which, so they, it was so bad that sometimes when I went with my mother, today you can't do this, an adult would say to my mother, what is wrong with her eyes? Because you, you know, it was all red, you couldn't miss it. Mm -hmm. And she'd have to say she has an eye infection, well, you know, something. But I was put, I was there for a week uh, Henry Katz's wife was not Jewish, she was a Quaker. And she called me the refugee kid, and she said the best thing for this refugee kid is to go to school. She taught kindergarten at the Mifflin School, Germantown, if you know Germantown. Mm -hmm. And uh, she put me in third grade. My first day in the Mifflin School, I was surrounded by a gang of kids, all saying something like, hello. I had no clue what they were saying because nobody was there to interpret for me. I was put in third grade. I sat in the last row in the last seat. The 
guy in front of me would pass me a piece of paper. I had a pencil. I had no clue what the teacher was saying. I handed a zero paper back every day for an entire year, third grade. Empty, not a word on it. Believe it or not, when I got my report card, which I had to show to my mother to sign, I got a sati S, satisfactory, in everything. I still, to this day, can't understand that. So I, my mother thinks I'm doing OK. And she signs <laughs> the paper. I did not share my problems with my parents for a very good reason. When I came home from school, the discussion was all about her sister who was sending letters, get my daughter out, what the hell is wrong with you? You know, get her out, you know, and things are bad in Germany. And they're discussing this, they're trying. And that's what they did. So my problem, no friends. How could I have friends? I mean, it's not like the American kids in want to be friendly. Sometimes a girl came over to talk to me. I didn't know what she was saying, so then she left. I mean, you have to converse. You have to, it's a give and take. So if some, you talk to someone, he doesn't respond. After a while, you say, well, what the heck? Mm -hmm. And you, you know, so, because to me, these were small problems compared to trying to get someone out of Germany so she won't die. You know, it's all yeah. how you see the... Yeah, like you were looking at the bigger issue. Yeah. Like, you said you still had to uh, rescue your family? It was still family back in... Oh, absolutely. Oh, okay. <coughs> absolutely. Yeah. Lots of family, most of the family. Mm. All right. Um, yeah. One more. Do you have one more? Right. One more. So, your dad... You, you know how you say he was a soldier from Germany? I'm sorry. Was your dad a soldier from Germany? Now, we're talking World War One. Yeah. Not only was my dad a soldier, all German Jews, men, you know, at that age level, served in the German army. I was just trying to explain that he was the middle of three brothers. You know, there were three guys. Uh -huh. And all of them served during World War I on the German side. They were all serving in France. My dad uh, got the medal because he happened to... Uh, I think what they didn't one never wanted to talk about it, but the little story I got was, it was simple. The, the Americans were like uh, just shooting, and s some of the buddies were like right. in shooting range, and he rescued them, something like that. All right, I have a question. Yeah. Did he give give y'all like the advantage for y'all to leave, like then the other group? Did he have like, the advantage? Because an of the fact that he was a soldier during World nah. War I, did that help you during Not only did he not have an advantage, I read stories later of where, you know how we have here for the GIs that have lost their legs and all kinds of horrible things happen to American GIs that are stuck in red hospitals. Later on in the war, they took these Jewish vets, they took their wheelchairs from them. They just dumped them somewhere. They took their, these are the veterans, these were the heroes, those that really did some super things to help their brethren in the service. They took everything away from them. It not, did not help one iota, whether you were a hero there or not. No help at all, none, zero. That's crazy. That is crazy, no question. All right, um, guys, thank you so much for your attention and questions. Really I want to thank all questions. you kids. You asked some terrific questions. And you guys can thank Ms. Breslin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys, we're going to be fourth class. Fourth